Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Lewin. I'm the CEO of the Computer History Museum. I hope everyone is well and safe. Today, I'm pleased to welcome you to our virtual event focused on the timely and important question, is AI racist? Our expert panel today will explore what is being done today about racism in AI and what more might be done in the future. Our programs are made possible through the generosity of our members and donors. And today we need your support more than ever to sustain the museum in delivering on our mission to decode technology for everyone, its computing past, digital present, and its future impact on humanity. And here today to introduce the program is, and the speakers is Marguerite Gong Hancock, the museum's VP of innovation. Marguerite. Thanks so much, Daniel. I'm delighted to add my warm welcome to each of you. Today's program continues the museum's ongoing commitment for important conversations at the intersection of tech and humanity to advance diversity, inclusion, equity, and access. Our focus today, decoding AI technologies and how they can impact racism. During the past week, we've hosted a companion screening of the award-winning documentary film, Coded Bias. Today's discussion will build on that film to address issues such as, are AI technologies racist by design or in their application? Is there racism in the AI community of makers, companies, or funders? Can AI be used to combat racism? And what more can be done? And specifically, what can we do as digital citizens to help contribute to better outcomes aligned with our values? We have an outstanding panel of experts to share their insights and experiences today. So as is CHM tradition, I'll introduce our speakers using five numbers. First, Lily Cheng, Corporate Vice President, Microsoft AI and Research. 27 years in technology, design and society. Five years focused on conversational AI. 45 universities that create design and tech uh, courses via Microsoft Design Expo. Five years as a registered architect of buildings in Tokyo and, and Los Angeles. 2016 Facebook friends. Welcome, Lily. Next is Charlton McElwain, Vice Provost of Faculty Engagement and Development at New York University, uh, the Center for Faculty Advancement. 20 years as an NYU professor. 25 people he has the privilege of leading at NYU Center for Faculty Advancement. Two books that he's written that he still really likes. Five books left to write and 75 pounds of barbecue made last weekend. So glad to have you here, Charlton. Next is Safia Noble, Associate Professor at UCLA in the Department of Information Studies. 10,312, the ranking of her Amazon bestseller for algorithms of oppression. 10 best books to read about race instead of asking a person of color to explain it to you as listed in Bustle Magazine. 234 talks given in the past eight years on research about algorithmic discrimination, racist tech, and the need for strengthening public goods like libraries. 59,000 followers on Twitter and 1970 birth year, an unapologetically Gen Xer. Welcome, Safia, so glad to have you here on CHM Live. Next is Deborah Raji, computer scientist and activist. Three fellowship positions, seven companies audited for, biased, audited for biased AI products, seven municipal facial recognition bans passed, 14 states with proposed facial recognition regulation, five summers running project includes free coding boot camps for low income youth. Thrilled to have you here as well, Raja, uh, Deborah. Uh, last but not least, we're so glad to feature our own uh, David Brock as moderator. David is his historian of technology and director of the CHM Software History Center and curator here at the museum. He's author of several books and has served as a writer and executive producer for television documentaries. David, thank you for leading today's conversation. Well, thank you so much, Marguerite. And um, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, in order to talk about racism and artificial intelligence, I'd like to begin by asking you all to speak first about racism itself. So um, what are some of the most important things that people should understand about racism? And what are some of the biggest misconceptions? Um, anyone who'd like to kick things off is, is welcome to. 
I feel right a little off. bit obliged like <laughs> as the Black Studies professor here also. Um, so maybe I'll just jump it off and please um, add and, and correct. I think, you know, one of the most important um, dimensions of racism is that it is a power structure and a hierarchical power structure at its most kind of basic fundamental um, dimensions. And usually this hierarchical power structure in the United States context, certainly it's really predicated upon the invention of racial categories. Um, the way that we experience those racial categories in the United States primarily been with kind of Europeanity or kind of those who are um, read and understood as white fitting into that um, kind of top most powerful category in our society and those who are read or are legally coded or encoded as black or of African descent or and also indigenous um, falling to the bottom of that hierarchical power structure. So this is one of the ways it's you know so important for us to understand race as a social construct, not a biological construct, not a matter of our ethnicity or our culture, but really a category that we're placed in and that people also petition through various means to um, move in and out of or across different um, uh, steps or categories in that power structure. And this is where we see, um, I think of the work of people like Dr. Vilna um, Bashi Treitler's uh, important book, The Ethnic Project. And this is where people of all kinds of ethnicities often fit into um, or, or are forced into these racial categories, right? That um, afford them different, um, you know, access to power, um, uh, experiences of discrimination and so forth. And those things get legally encoded um, as well as become part of cultural practice. So that's really what race and racism are. And I think um, it's really important. Of course, these often get flattened and collapsed with ethnicity. So while I am black or African-American in my ethnicity, that is also the racial category that I am encoded into that um, can in many ways over-determine um, my life chances, for example, and the way that I'll experience my life. I mean, I'll... I'll... I think right. I think this topic is also very personal for a lot of people. You know, for most of us on the panel. I mean, I was born in Tokyo, um, where I really look like I fit in, but I I don't speak Japanese. And then I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, um, and um, I, I feel like I can probably live most places because those are pretty extreme cities. But I think over my life, um, being Asian has really has really changed a lot where, you know, in the tech industry, you know, there are a lot of Asians in the tech industry. And so in a sense, um, you know, my life in Nebraska, you know, I really felt like I was the only person there um, who was Asian. And then in tech today, um, you know, there almost seems like there's, you know, a very different problem. So anyway, I think my main point is I think things can change, things can get better. And um, we really um, owe the world, you know, um, especially for those of us who work in tech, um, you know, the responsibility to make to make it better for people. Um, and just to add to this, um, there's a great sort of um, project report um, out of Data and Society, which is, you know, a research org in New York, and um, they published this report on attempting sort of to sort of teach racial literacy in the technology industry. Um, so they have a report called, I think it's called Racial Literacy in Tech. And um, I really like the way that they explain racial literacy um, to sort of technologists and people in the tech space where they discuss sort of three different categories where they talk about, you know, interpersonal interactions um, with racism where, you know, individuals, marginalized individuals are experiencing, you know, um, uh, certain microaggressions or, you know, aggress uh, explicitly aggressive uh, hostile environments. Um, and that that's definitely sort of under the realm of what needs to be addressed um, uh, when we talk about racism. Um, and then there's also sort of this like layer of discourse that's very intellectual. Um, and I I'm Canadian. So um, in Canada, there's definitely a lot of 
um, issues where you know Black Canadians and indig Indigenous um, Indigenous people sort of experience a lot of racism, but it's not as heavily discussed a topic as it is in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I learned coming into the U.S. was a very rich vocabulary around how to talk about race. Um, you know, terminology like intersectionality and all these words that helped sort of put uh, language to certain experiences that I had. There's that intellectual level of discourse and education that happens um, and that the, the sort of tech field needs to catch up on. And then there's sort of this third layer, which are institutional barriers to um, those that are, you know, of marginalized races or, um, or sort of put into these marginalized categories. Um, and those institutional barriers are probably one of the hardest things to resist, especially in the tech space. So if you think about, um, you know, to Lily's point around, you know, who makes up the tech industry and how those people are recruited and how those people are mentored and fostered. Um, when I first started working in tech, that for me was one of the biggest hurdles was that beginning to identify and articulate my experience within, you know, these institutional structures that I could feel uh, were sort of, um, you know, had these hidden barriers that were very difficult to identify and to point to and to, to um, even discuss or talk about. So all these, the fact that there's sort of these three layers of, of um, issues where, you know, if you experience racism, it's very difficult to share, uh, you know, what your personal experience has been. It's very difficult to find the vocabulary to have an intellectual discussion about it. And then it's most difficult to um, even identify some of these institutional barriers or structural harms that uh, come as a result of racism. Um, so because there's so many different forms in which this takes, it, it can become quite challenging, um, you know, for those that aren't well versed or educated about the different forms racism can present itself to actually, you know, identify when it happens and have conversations with people to make changes necessary for um, those that are marginalized to feel, you know, more welcome and more, uh, you know, empowered to actually contribute. And I'll um, add mine here. It's uh, it's interesting that um, you know before now addressing the question is AI racist twenty plus years ago when I started my career, I was asking the question, uh, are political ads racist? And over this 20 year period, I basically operated with the same uh, definition of racism that I think informed both the prior conversations that I was engaged in quite a lot and those that uh, we're engaged in now around technology. Um, and that is that racism to me is a system of institutions and institutional practices that structurally, system, systematically uh, produce disparate advantages and disadvantages, privileges and power along racial lines. Um, and so that's the definition I operate on. And there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot there to unpack, but mostly what I wanna do and the reason that I uh, sort of always stick to that basic definition is to resist, I think, the temptation to re re uh, reduce racism to individual level pre prejudice or discrimination, uh, things about our internal motivations or our thinking uh, that none of us quite has access to when we think about uh, other people that we are engaged with. And so part of me wants to um, uh, engage this definition to talk about systems and structures um, because I think that's the level at which we must engage if we are to radically and uh, significantly change not only our history, but uh, uh, our future when it comes to both racism and racism in the context of uh, technology. Um, and it was interesting as I was, have been over the last few weeks looking around at um, anti-racist technology and uh, thinking about this question, um, I start to see already where uh, folks conflate the idea of racism or even anti-racism with uh, individual level prejudices or thinking about intentions or thinking about the work that individual people uh, can do. And certainly that is important, but I think I don't want to um, uh, sort of let us off the hook uh, in terms of the deep and expansive work of thinking about institutions uh, and the way that those institutions and systemic um, actions have very much built an infrastructure on which our technolo technology uh, is very much uh, based. Thank you all very much. Um, before, we, before we maybe move to 
ne next, maybe clarifying what we mean by artificial intelligence, uh, having, having given some uh, attention to how we should think about racism. Um, I did want to ask um, uh, Safia if she could talk a little bit about a concept that Deb raised, which is um, intersectionality. I know it's something that uh, I personally uh, learned more about from reading your book, and it's about how, you know, these hierarchical power structures of both of race and and gender kind of uh, intersect. Um, would you mind speaking a little bit about that before we turn to artificial intelligence? Sure, I'm happy to. You know, intersectionality is really a kind of a, a black feminist, um, you know, theoretical way of, uh, and practical way of understanding the world when, um, when you have both race and gender and they are kind of um, prioritized one over the other. And yet the kind of the nexus of being both a person of color and a woman really, and in the case of kind of black feminist um, traditions, you know, um, to be both black and a woman is a double bind, let's say. We could think of it that way in terms of living under systems of, um, of you know, profound sexism, discrimination in pay, discrimination in um, hiring, and um, lifespan, projected lifespan, access to you know um, high quality medical care, education. There's so many things that we could look at speaking to those kinds of institutions that Charlton mentioned. So intersectionality means that we have to look at not just the impact of um, racism, uh, and let's say in the tech sector that while we might um, look to see how many African-Americans are funded by venture capitalists, for example, you'll see that it's almost in, you know, uh, almost invisible. The amount of that funding for black people goes to black women. So I think these are the kinds of things that are really important when we're talking about race that we cannot not talk about gender because um, for black women, we are in, again, this kind of double bind often um, experiencing, and I love, um, uh, uh, there's a wonderful film also in addition to Coded Bias called Invisible Portraits that's recently come out where um, what, that talks about kind of the experiences of Black women in contemporary American society and the ways in which um, under racism, Black women are likely to be incredibly discriminated against and, um, you know, kind of forced to the bottom of um, the lowest wages and the least amount of opportunity and also under kind of the gender constructs. Um, equally there too. And so you, what you find are uh, many times black and indigenous women at the bottom of every type of um, power system um, uh, as a collective. And so you find, for example, black women and children are um, um, mo more likely than any other group to live in um, long-term sustained poverty. Um, and so the interventions that we think about um, and of course, I love Deb's work is so important um, in the gender shade study um, and the work that she's done there to help us understand, um, again, how uh, algorithms and, um, you know, as deployed through facial recognition technologies are um, less likely to detect Black women's faces, right? And this has incredible um, uh, dimensions. I noticed this in my own research when studying Google, the way in which Black women were um, more likely than any other group to be represent, misrepresented through pornography or derogatory stereotyping. Um, so I think these are the kinds of questions that you ask when you're looking with an intersectional lens on um, not just what happens to Black people, not just what happens to women, but what happens to people who live at that intersection. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, unless somebody would like to to respond directly on this, I thought uh, maybe I like, we could, oh, oh, please, please go ahead. <laughs> I have like a quick comment to yes. that, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, um, I really appreciate that sort of breakdown of intersectionality and completely agree. Um, something else I wanted to add was that, you know, often um, you we forget people at the intersection. It's very easy when talking about um, race to forget black women and it's very easy when talking about gender to forget black women mm -hmm. um, so that's why it's important to sort of 
have intersectional analysis to highlight the impact of people, you know, at this intersection point that are so easily forgotten when we're just keeping the conversation to, you know, these unitary categories of race or gender. Um, and that was really a lot of what Gender Shades contribution was, was sort of making the field realize that, um, you know, when you don't actively think about individuals at the intersection and you just keep the conversation at the level of let's just talk about race or let's just talk about gender, um, it's very easy to forget those people at the intersection. It's very easy to completely discount um, or erase the impact of, you know, particular deployment or products performance on this intersectional group of Black women. Just wanted to flag that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um... Well, I, I would definitely, in, in a moment, love to to have both of you expand, all four of you expand about your your individual work and experiences. But maybe just before we turn to that, I thought that we could um, spend a moment talking about the term or the concept artificial intelligence itself. You know, artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence technologies are are categories that are simultaneously broad diverse and and blurry. So I, I wanted to ask all of you, what are some of the most important things that people un should understand about artificial intelligence and how to think about artificial intelligence, particularly when it comes to um, this discussion of, of race and racism? Um, I have a, yeah. I guess a comment, um, uh, and Charlton kind of mentioned it in his definition of racism around um, a lot of the changes required are these institutional structural changes and people are very uh, keen to focus on the interpersonal um, uh, interactions of prejudice and, and, um, and that sort of being potentially um, sort of a distraction uh, from some of these more structural issues. I think, you know, the framing of is AI racist, um, there was a bit of discussion about this where, you know, AI, I, I think sometimes when people hear that term or they hear that phrase, uh, they sort of characterize AI in the way that they would characterize a human that's racist. So, the, you know, the, the idea being that, oh, we need to hold AI to account for its prejudiced beliefs or that, you know, there's somehow malicious actors sort of building these systems with the purpose of perpetuating, you know, racist outcomes. And, you know, there are situations where that is the case, you know, a lot of, um, you know, very explicitly alt-right groups are behind um, many surveillance companies. And, you know, One Zero has done a lot of investigations into the ties between, you know, white supremacists and alt-right groups and some of these companies that have perpetuated racist outcomes. But that's not the sort of typical scenario. Usually what you have is uh, a situation where no one is thinking about racial equity as part of the development process for a particular product or a particular system. Um, and, you know, AI is a very broad term. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna let maybe another person try to define that and pin that down, but it, it sort of encompasses a broad range of technologies that um, are meant to emulate, you know, human cognitive processes and attempt to automate certain aspects of, you know, a wider system. And sometimes, you know, just the introduction of that automation you know, puts individuals, marginalized individuals at risk. So there, there's a lot of thinking that needs to go into making um, a system equitable, you know, in the first place. So if you think of healthcare, um, you know, uh, Sophia mentioned some examples of, you know, healthcare outcomes and, um, you know, socioeconomic outcomes being, um, you know, uh, uh, quite horrific for, you know, women of color at the, at the current moment. You know that can that that's a system that already exists, and there's a lot of institutional barriers that prevent you know individuals that are marginalized from you know benefiting from these systems. But when you introduce technology and you automate some of these processes, at times you reduce accountability or you erase accountability in ways that can you know make it harder for an individual to appeal a decision um, that they can't really see into because there's a model instead of a person there. Um, so you know I think there's a lot of ways that you know, AI is mostly just a way to sort of solidify infrastructure in many systems that um, affect, you know, marginalized individuals. And that sort of ends up leading into more, um, you know, biased outcomes or racist outcomes. And it's not necessarily a situation where, you know, AI is, AI being racist is as a human being racist, but sort of the introduction of these automated systems or, um, you know, the way these automated systems are being developed without any consciousness of its impact on racist outcomes um, is what leads to AI being racist. Um, so I just wanted to sort of 
flag that as the way that I'm thinking about that term or that phrase of is AI racist because um, I think it can be very easy to you know frame because a the goal of AI artificial intelligence is you know to build a machine with you know uh, abilities that resemble human cognitive abilities people often like to ascribe you know moral agency to some of these machines and they try to frame it as you know um, frame these models and these technical products as you know being capable of doing good or doing you know horrible things but in reality um, there it's it's technology it's an artifact it's the decision or the result of a lot of uh, you know individual engineering uh, decisions um, and design decisions so I I guess to just sort of like contextualize this in the conversation of is AI racist? I really think, you know, framing AI as part of infrastructure within these broader systems is sort of an essential starting point um, where it's really important to differentiate, um, you know, uh, the actual technical artifact from the humans that might be making decisions that lead to a racist outcome um, rather than framing the technology itself as this, you know, moral agent making racist decisions. It reminds me very much of what Charlton was was just saying before, Deb, what, you know, in terms of systems and structures rather than, you know, individual prejudice or, or animus. Um, uh, so please, anyone else, jump right in. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to add in there that, uh, you know, I think, uh, number one, I think that was uh, uh, really well put, uh, Deb, and I think leads to really the way that I conceive of and really think about, you um, AI as well. And one of the reasons I like this particular question of thinking about systemic and institutional racism um, is because it functions much like AI systems. And so we're talking a lot about like things in ways that I think helps folks understand the way that race racism uh, gets uh, uh, to be so wound up with uh, AI systems in, in many different ways. Um, so, I, you know, I like to think about AI um, in the kind of uh, uh, sense that's very uh, demystifying and uh, not sort of, sort of all powerful and the kinds of agency that we like to give to uh, uh, what this thing is. And sometimes I do that in sort of reducing it just to uh, statistics, uh, which I won't do here, but um, in many ways, AI is simply the marshalling of uh, social scientific statistical uh, practices of modeling and so forth uh, in automated systems. And so if we think about um, sort of just two terms that I think are good uh, to help uh, define or uh, bound our definition about AI and think about learning, uh, which I'll put in air quotes there, and uh, automation. And so systems that are fed and that are uh, that digest data, that find patterns in that data, that utilize those patterns to predict, um, again, quote unquote, future outcomes, and therefore influence how we make decisions. Um, and so we operationalize those patterns uh, that emerge from data and uh, patterns that are very much, um, uh, you know, some like to say predictive of the future, some I would say are representative much more of replicating uh, the past, uh, but it's these relationships between variables and those outcomes that we're trying to predict that get operationalized in algorithms uh, that then are used to power automated systems that then drive decisions and outcomes on a sort of automatic um, basis. And so based on whatever inputs that are uh, put into systems, outcomes that are uh, derived from it based on uh, particular pairing and relationships of data that are in ingested into um, the system. Uh, and so that's what I like to think of when I think about uh, what is uh, AI, not on the sort of sense of thinking about uh, robots uh, that will uh, take over the world as it were, but as a process of thinking about how we uh, try to um, uh, think about social life, human behavior in uh, computational ways, which again has a very long history. And I think uh, defining and thinking about AI in this way helps us to bring that history into conversation uh, with the present, particularly when we think about 
um, issues around race, racism, discrimination, and how those things develop and therefore are intertwined when it comes to uh, AI systems. Yeah. Lily, could I ask? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just about to I'm ask you to jump in. <laughs> yeah, I love how Charles and, and Deb have framed that. And, you know, maybe just to repeat, it's, a, you know, it's basically a, a system that can learn um, by discerning patterns in data and um, make some sort of decision or prediction based on those patterns. And I think, you know, that's kind of a very here and now um, sort of definition of AI that we want to make sure we shape. There's a much, you know, broader dream for AI, um, which is really, you know, understanding and, you know, human thought and intelligent behavior. And that's, that's a long ways out, you know, from uh, maybe, you know, things that, that we can do today. Um, so I really love that kind of here and now um, description. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think also there's some different pieces to that. So there's, you know, bias in, you know, the data itself. In a sense, AI and a lot of these patterns and data and decision-making just reflect today or can reflect, you know, whatever data you're putting into it. So there's bias in data. There can be bias, you know, in algorithms and, you know, the, the machine learning algorithms there, you know, if you think of AI in a social network, um, there could be bias in, you know, the data you're being fed, the data that you fill in. So there's, there's lots of different aspects of racism um, in AI, and it might be helpful for us, you know, to kind of separate out some of these pieces, the, the data itself, the algorithms, and then, you know, in a social network, it's really, you know, the people and the usage and how these systems are used. Um, and in a sense, I think it's, you know, it's good to think it is reflecting society. So just the bigger conversation of, you know, AI and, you know, ethics and AI, um, how we can do better there, you know, and that goes all the way from fairness and uh, reliability, privacy and security to the transparency and accountability that, you know, others have mentioned. Um, for me, it's, you know, it's, um, it's kind of amazing. I mean, I've spent most of my time in Microsoft research and the very first two groups in Microsoft research, I think it's, you know, Microsoft research is what, like 25 or 30 years old or speech and language, you know, how people talk, the languages that we support, do we support um, every spoken language or just a few certain, you know, spoken languages? And, um, you know, we've had this dream that this technology can, you know, be more human and um, respond more to the way people interact. So it's, it's, you know, it's amazing. I think in the last five years, records that we thought we would never break, like matching human parity with speech dictation, um, you know, the vision, um, being able to better understand things in pictures or do more with the words that you type. Um, there's so much potential and, you know, it's a tool and a weapon. You know, Brad Smith um, from Microsoft wrote this great book that I recommend people read of, you know, what are some of the systemic things that we should think about and make sure that we think ahead. Um, so I think it's a really exciting time and um, yeah, I think we owe it, uh, you know, working at Microsoft or anybody who works in big tech, um, you know, to think of it in a social context because it does, it doesn't have to reflect, you know, just whatever data you put into it. Well, I thought maybe now we could shift and, and um, I could ask each of you to describe some of the technologies that in your, your own personal experience and work really made clear to you the importance of thinking about race, racism, and artificial intelligence. And, um, you know, I all know that you, you I know that you all have uh, interesting stories to tell. So anyone who'd like to begin, um, please. Um, uh, or I could just say, maybe Safia, I could ask you to talk about, you know, your work on um, internet search that, um, you know, was the, the basis for your book, Algorithms of Oppression. Sure, happy to. So I should probably just contextualize that when I started, um, uh, well, I went back to graduate school after a 15-year career in advertising and marketing. And at the time that I was doing that, going back, 
for a PhD, I was um, acutely aware of the way in which um, advertising agencies, public relations agencies, this is very, very early years of search engine optimization um, work. Uh, there wasn't even like an industry for that yet. Um, we were thinking about how to game search engines to have our clients' products and services show up on the first page in ways that look like, um, you know, what we would have called advertorial, um, you know, uh, content written by the agency, but made to look like it was editorial or um, uh, strong, positive public opinion. So I was really, you know, kind of aware of that going back into um, library and information um, science. Uh, I went to the the high school at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And at the time we were kind of in the throes, large scale academic universities were in the scale um, or academic libraries um, engaged in the Google Book Digitization Project. But this is important because the Google Book Digitization Project was a project that so many libraries around the world, while well, in the English speaking and, and European um, libraries were super en enthused by, and they were handing over millions and millions of volumes to be digitized by Google, um, which will ultimately, I think, you know, we understand were being used for machine learning. Um, but, you know, it was really interesting to me as I was watching this project unfold, I was thinking about the future of knowledge and the future of information for communities, because when you're in library school, you're thinking about things like, what will be our knowledge base a thousand years from now? What should we keep and what should we let go? How, do, how does knowledge or access to it or lack of access to it profoundly shape um, things like freedom and liberation for people, especially for oppressed people or people who have not been um, afforded the opportunity to read or write? I mean, there's so many different dimensions of this. And so I started looking closely at Google because at the time, um, for those of us who've been on the internet for a really long time, we remember what it was like pre-search engine. And it was kind of a messy mess. I mean, when we think about like the early um, directories and kind of directory driven um, knowledge organization, these were in fact called virtual libraries. Um, I was thinking about that kind of pre like web 1.0, let's say environment up through um, uh, the rise of search engines. And so I started looking at knowledge and communities. How were people and communities represented in these search systems, which were kind of like this new 2.0 virtual library environment. And I found that they were of course nothing, anything but a virtual library. When I did searches on various identities and I did many, 80, you know, so many different kinds of combinations. Um, what I found over and over is that women and girls were hypersexualized, commodified, kind of treated like commodity objects, black women, Asian women and girls, Latina women and girls, um, mostly represented pornographically or again, in these hypersexualized ways. And I thought, you know, this is actually something very different than let's say when Hollywood does this to us, because we understand Hollywood as a certain kind of unidirectional um, communication channel. When people go to search, and I knew this from my advertising days, people think they're going to a fact checker. They think they're going to a knowledge machine. So what happens there is actually extremely important. We have to pay attention and studying the way in which different ideas and concepts about our social world and about communities, and especially around disenfranchised and marginalized people was so profoundly skewed and misrepresented. Um, that really led to kind of years of collecting evidence and, and doing research in this space to understand um, how kind of banal, what I think of as banal technologies, banal AI, something like search. No one's giving that a second thought, I promise you. We're definitely worried about Deb's research and facial recognition. We're not caring about what happens in a search engine. We care about social media as a threat to democracy, for example, or a place that propagates hate, organizes white supremacists, organizes against you know, the United States um, government. We don't think about search when people go to use it like a fact checker and a knowledge portal. And so for me, this was an extremely important um, wake up call about um, the loss of the public good, um, public goods like schools and libraries and universities um, to kind of these new digital emerging um, um, advertising platforms that that 
truly are multinational advertising platforms that proxy like knowledge institutions. And I think that's an incredible threat to many communities and it's an incredible threat to democracy. And so that's what where I really kind of saw and noticed these things. Um, Lily, could I ask you to share with us your experience with um, the that, uh, chatbot system that was called Tay? Yeah, so that was my um, big, that was, that was, that was, so we created a chatbot um, called Tay, which most people have heard of. And, you know, the idea initially was to have it um, interact with lots of students. And so we had tested it. And um, I think one of the things that we did sort of last minute is we decided, well, we should try this on Twitter, which turned out to be maybe not the best decision. So for those of you who don't know, we put Tay up and within, I would say half a day, maybe a few hours, um, there was a feature on Tay which would let you, um, well, there's a feature in Twitter that lets you spoof accounts, which is probably not the best thing. And then there was also a feature in, in Tay that would let you, um, let it repeat after you. And so um, unbeknownst to us, you know, there were these groups that thought it would be um, you know, basically kind of took Tay over. And, um, and I guess for me, it was, it was just, it was such a crazy day because maybe a month before we had done a talk um, with Anita Sarkozian talking about how Twitter had kind of attacked her person. And we really should have seen, you know, we should have maybe seen that coming, but um you know, I really was so surprised by the darkness on Twitter mm -hmm. and those audiences. And, you know, that day, um, you know, obviously people in our company were sending Satya lots of mail. So I got every single one of those mails from Satya forwarded to me and say, well, Lily, Lily can maybe tell you what happened. And so we had mail from, you know, people who were Jewish, people who were female, we pretty much offended everybody. And he was really amazing. I mean, he sent me this mail and he said, you know, you're not alone. Um, and, you know, I think from that and other moments, we really at Microsoft um, created this whole um, system to really think about ethics and AI. And in a sense, you know, um, it could have been a lot worse, I think, these systems, because that system, you know, Tay was not a person like Anita. And, you know, we could take it down and really think about the communities or the context where we were putting AI. And I think it also made pretty much everybody in industry sit up and think about what, what um, it, it kind of made that topic of racism come to the surface. I mean, mm -hmm. I had to give a talk at NYU maybe the next week and I thought, well, what am I gonna say? I'm from Microsoft and I'm talking to a bunch of people you know, in the film school what have we done that they're going to really know? And of course, I was like, oh my gosh, well, they'll definitely know about Tay because that's like in every. <laughs> so it, it, I think AI, um, AI is a topic that everybody can understand because they've all seen science fiction films. So they can understand this metaphor of technology in a negative light. I think most US science fiction sort of portrays man against the machine, typically man. Um, whereas if you think of, you know, AI and science fiction in other cultures, like, you know, maybe Japan, you might think of Totoro or something like more friendly or ghosts and things like that. But I think the word AI um, makes everyone think about what is the future that we are trying to build with technology? Is this morally, humanly the future that we want? So I actually love the term because this, as, as you know, as noted before, people should have been really worried about internet search, your cell phone, a web browser. You know, they all have machine learning embedded in them and, and systems which um, are biased. And, and this has been going on for a long time, but I think the term AI makes people think differently about technology, um, which is a great thing. Um, and I think for me, working on Tay, that changed my life in the way that I think about racism and technology and the community. Because, you know, I basically, Twitter's a public system. And so we could look at every single person that interacted with Tay that day. Uh, a friend of mine 
um, and academia actually sent me an analysis of clusters and I looked at every profile. You know, there were four main clusters, um, technologists, anti-feminists, gamers, and Trump supporters. This was very early in the Trump campaign. And just seeing the pictures of all the people um, was just so disturbing. And I do think that we, we don't always, we see the part of the world that we know, right? So for me, I love Twitter. I mean, the people who founded it were my friends and we were, um, you know, we were a very close knit social group um, when it first started. So that was my view of Twitter, um, which is very different obviously than the view of Twitter that I saw with Tay. So in a sense, I'm grateful that it happened. I think, you know, there wasn't, um, I think as a company, it really did influence us. And we've done some really great things around bias and data. Um, we have, you know, for any AI project that you do, we have lots of ways to review it and to look at all the aspects of AI, the data, the algorithms, you know, the way we assess things after they go out, the ability to, to change things. Um, so that's been, that's been really amazing. But it was, a, but that was not my most fun day at work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Deb, could I ask you to talk about your, your experience with facial recognition technology? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, uh, I, I guess to sort of uh, ground a bit of um, my experience, I, I like to mention um, Lily's point earlier, there's this vision of AI as this sort of like artificial being, um, this sort of cognitive machine. And then there's sort of the reality of, um, of you know, AI as we see it in deployment today. And um, in my mind, I sort of see the comparison. Um, uh, my background's in robotics. I studied robotics in school. And it would sort of be the difference between, you know, Sophia the robot, which is this very humanistic uh, robotic being, looks very like, like almost like a humanoid type uh, thing. And, and the Roomba, which is really the robot that a lot of humans interact with on a daily basis. It's a much simpler machine. Um, makes a lot more mistakes, but it's in millions of homes. So in my mind, um, you know, uh, uh, a lot of my experience in terms of this work has been with Roombas, has been with, um, you know, simpler algorithms or, um, you know, th there's this, there's been this conversation happening around machine learning. And my definition of machine learning is when, you know, you uh, rather in typical software, uh, you know, a software engineer will define uh, the rules through which, you know, you, you process the input and, and come up with, you know, uh, decisions as to, you know, how to, how to manipulate a particular outcome. Uh, with machine learning, those, those rules are not defined by a software engineer. They're derived through a process of learning through data. Um, and that, you know, changes the game in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I, uh, got into this space by virtue of, you know, getting very excited about startups and working at a computer vision startup um, uh, in New York um, uh, that, uh, you know, was a, a very sort of uh, up and coming group and they were super rigorous and, and very sort of at the edge in terms of performance. Um, but even in that group, uh, it was very clear that there were a lot of engineering decisions that were happening as they developed these machine learning systems that they were not you know, consciously aware of, or even, you know, documenting or recording or um, thinking very carefully about. So, you know, for example, um, you know, I had sort of participated on a project where, you know, we were tasked with developing a moderation model um, uh, to filter out nudity from, you know, uh, you know the, a client's platform. And uh, the data set that was curated for that task was, you know, very heavily skewed, uh, biased and, you know, towards one population, usually, uh, you know, darker skinned women as Sophia Noble's work sort of reveals um, a lot of the, the sort of examples for not safe for work images were mostly people of color. And a lot of the examples for safe images, um, you know, derived from, from sort of uh, internet image search uh, results uh, were, were, you know, uh, white individuals and white subjects. So it ended up that our model, you know, once we trained it and deployed it, would be disproportionately filtering out the content of people of color. And that was deployed for, you know, months before um, the client realized that that um, outcome was happening. And, and, and what it resulted in was that um, 
you know, on the, the client's platform, uh, the content being uploaded by people of color would be disproportionately flagged as mm. not safe for work and, and removed. Um, so that was my introduction to this space where I was, you know, part of the teams, you know, developing these machine learning products and realizing, oh, wait, we're not, we're not thinking through some of these decisions we're making about the data. And we're just, you know, collecting as much data as we can in order to, you know, um, define the rules that we need this 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 system to be making um so that was really um a lot of what woke me up to this issue and what prompted me to reach out to joy Buemwini at the mit media lab who at the same time was sort of uh like the other person <laughs> thinking about these problems um i i think the conversation around ethics um in ai and fairness in ai um is, is um you know gratefully sort of this very common discussion that we're having today, but a couple of years ago, it really wasn't. Mm. Um, I remember trying to raise these issues to my manager at the time and not getting a very sort of strong response. And part of the reason is that, um, you know, a lot of machine learning, modern day machine learning techniques just require a lot of data period. So the idea of, you know, um, you know, jeopardizing the, the, the quantity of the data that we had by virtue of thinking about, you know, representation, thinking about how we're labeling and curating these data sets um, to define these models uh, made people sort of panic a little bit because it's just so much more work <laughs> um, uh, than what, uh, for what was already a very difficult problem. So, you know, uh, the resistance to that work was very clear and Joy was actually one of very few people at the time that was, you know, uh, very concerned about these issues. Timnit Gebru was also someone that was very um, sort of passionate about these topics. And I don't think it's a coincidence we were all black women <laughs> either. Um, we, we, we all had personal experiences, you know, working with facial recognition technology, understanding that, um, you know, the technology wasn't effective for people with our skin type and with our gender expression. Um, I had actually also, while at Clarify, worked on a facial recognition product and realized that the data sets being used were sort of disproportionately underrepresenting um, people of color in the data sets and the sort of research data sets and also, um, you know, data sets being used as part of commercial products that were deployed for clients. So uh, following these experiences at the company, I reached out to Joy, joined her at the Media Lab, um, and we started thinking about, you know, how do we, um, what, what needs to change about the way we evaluate these systems in order for us to better understand their performance on, um, you know, not just these benchmarks that we're used to seeing, which we recognized already at that point, the benchmarks being used in industry and in research where, um, you know, misrepresenting uh, different uh, or sort of disproportionately representing um, you know, different demographics. So we uh, created the pilot parliaments benchmark, which was a benchmark that was, you know, very consciously curated mm. um, uh, for balanced representation for, you know, gender expression and skin type. And we evaluated, you know, mainstream uh, facial recognition, facial analysis products on this benchmark to see and to assess, you know, how well does this product actually work for these different demographic subgroups that we're really worried about. Um, you know, what we found was that a lot of the products failed for the darker female subgroup, you know, performance uh, of many of these, uh, the performance of many of these sort of commercially deployed products were, you know, less than 70% accuracy for the darker female subgroup, while consistently performing at 100% accuracy for the lighter male subgroup. So this discrepancy revealed you know, one, um, uh, it, it kind of reinforced my own personal experience of, you know, an engineering practice that was very underdeveloped. Um, I already knew by virtue of being on an applied machine learning team that, you know, the field was sort of rife with um, a lot of, you know, um, uh, sort of casual decision making around uh, mm -hmm. data and evaluation that needed to be seriously challenged. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, a lack of perspective on how these deployed systems would be performing or impacting different communities. Um, so, you know, with facial recognition specifically, the fact that it fails specifically for, you know, darker skinned individuals and, you know, specifically darker skinned women puts their life at risk in very serious ways. One of the companies we audited was Amazon, which at around the same time we audited them, the ACLU had, you know, recently discovered through an investigation that they were attempting to pitch their technology, their facial recognition technology that did not work on darker skinned individuals uh, to police. Um, and later on, there were a couple cases of, you know, um, black men misidentified 
uh, through you know false, uh, false facial recognition matches and that escalating to the point of arrest. Um, and this was really what clicked for me in the sense of you know sometimes these failures happen on the groups that are most vulnerable for the situation to escalate to a point of serious harm. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you have a police department, which is um, you know unfortunately the case in a lot of uh, cities in the U.S., if you have a police department that's prejudiced against a particular population. Um, and you have a technology that's more likely to fail or to mis misidentify, you know, individuals from a, from that from that same population. The likelihood of that misidentification escalating to the point of a false arrest is so much higher. Um, so that kind of dynamic between some of these structural barriers um, that individuals experience um, of racism and uh, uh, you know, the technology that we introduce into these situations and the, the sort of biases inherent in these technologies became very clear to me uh, doing this work. Uh, so that that's sort of been my experience so far. And we've seen a very similar pattern with, um, you know, risk assessments with, um, you know, algorithms used in um, sort of uh, the allocation of different resources and prioritization algorithms for things like, you know, organ transplants or um, as part of, you know, um, uh, healthcare management uh, systems. So there's so many ways in which just the introduction of these algorithms and their biases, you know, put individuals that are already vulnerable uh, at greater risk of, of, of further harm. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, I wanted to, Charlton, I know from my reading of your work that you have a concern with um, automation and, and race, I, I, but I wasn't sure just what exactly brought you into looking at this nexus of, of kind of race and artificial intelligence. Would you, would you share with us your experience? Absolutely, it's really twofold. Um, the first I would say is very much uh, began with my uh, fortunate meeting of Sophia Noble now years ago and talking about sort of what was on the horizon and what people weren't engaged in. And so thinking about uh, search and search algorithms and the ways in which it not only reproduced um, negative representations of black women and, and others uh, raced individuals, but the way in which it also produced um, sort of lack of opportunity in terms of, as Sylvia mentioned earlier, uh, when we go and think about a knowledge system and treat search as such, and then find that certain things are not there or certain things are not visible, particularly information of use and about the experiences of people of color, uh, the detrimental impact that that could have. So that uh, was my sort of first um, I would say real strong introduction into this uh, sort of AI uh, space and thinking about many of the concerns and so forth that have developed over the years. Um, the second I will, I will talk about was really um, had to do with my more recent work with uh, writing the book Black Software. Um, and that I always talk about, um, you know, about three years ago, I think it was now, uh, that the Intercept uh, investigative uh, reporting um, uh, uh, site that had come out with this report and this dovetails right where, um, where Deb just uh, left off. Um, they'd come out with a report that was uh, sort of uncovering that the NYPD had been sharing all of its camera data around this, the, uh, the city uh, with IBM for the purpose of IBM building a facial recognition system that will utilize and operationalize skin color as a primary uh, way in which to identify criminal uh, suspects. Um, and so the report was, you know, sort of twofold, like number one, um, this is happening um, and uh, sort of how messed up that, that is. Uh, the second one though, was they were revealing that this had been going on, this collaboration had been going on in secret between the NYPD and between IBM uh, for five years. Mm. And I remember at that moment of reading that story and thinking, um, you folks really missed the boat on this one. <laughs> Um, because this was not a five-year relationship. This was about a more than 50-year one, uh, both specifically in terms of relationship between the NYPD and IBM, uh, but more broadly between law enforcement communities and the technical um, or technology uh, communities um, more broadly. Uh, and so what that moment was really about for me and thinking about the work that I had been doing two and three years prior to that was finding that 
you know, all of these things, all, all of these uh, systems around uh, AI, particularly in the law enforcement space, uh, had an origin story that goes well beyond what we usually think about. And we think about AI as a very presentist conversation and moment of thinking about uh, mm. what could be and uh, what we should do. Um, but my work had really traced all of that to a much more uh, earlier point in time that was, um, I think, influential to me in, in many ways, but for the most part, interesting because it was at a time when the racial aspect of the systems and the systems that were being uh, built in 1964, 65, 66 uh, were very explicit about their uh, mm. racist motivations. That is, uh, to think about this moment in and around 1964, 65, where the nation's uh, most pressing problem is very explicitly a race problem and more specifically a problem of black people, black people in urban areas, uh, primarily who are uh, poor, uh, being the problem in which our computational systems were then called into being to help serve. And what we find then early on in this process by 1967, 68, you essentially have the seeds of all of the kinds of AI technologies that we talk about today facial recognition, location tracking, recidivism and risk scoring systems, uh, sophisticated CompStat and uh, police command and control systems, all of which were fully conceived of and operational with the exception maybe of facial recognition um, in and around 1968. And so to see this genealogy from our, what we might call our AI past or one aspect of our AI past to our present, spoke a lot to me and mostly about the ways in which when we start to think about our future, um, I think magnifies that sense in which we have so much to overcome. Uh, when we realize that we have not only 50 or 60 years of a technological infrastructure that was built on top of a preceding racist uh, social political structure, I think this serves us in thinking about uh, the level of work that we have to, to, to really be doing if we are to make our uh, AI future uh, look much different than what our uh, present uh, looks like. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, that story of continuity is, um, is very daunting in a way. Um, and, um, but your, your comment about you know, acknowledging that for shaping the future um, really uh, leads into the next topic that I'd really like to pose for all of you, which is kind of about building that future, if you will, and to ask um, if we could explore some of the ways that artificial intelligence um, is or um, could be anti-racist or put to anti-racist purposes. Um, I'd be interested for any of your perspectives on, on, um, on that kind of work that's going on. Well, let me just offer that. Um, for, first of all, I just, um, I appreciate this conversation so much because one of the things that it reminds me of is that it is truly, um, we're in this conversation because so many social scientists and humanists have been studying the impact and historians. I know Charlton, you're a political scientist, but also are a historian. Um, and and this, these, this type of work is the reason why we can be in this conversation today. I mean, Deb, I was thinking about um, what you said about you and Joy and to me getting together and working on gender shades. And, you know, I was in the same boat 10 years ago, just trying to find four people who would sit on a dissertation committee and affirm my work when I was alleging in my dissertation that, that technical systems, AI systems could be racist to the level of, of code, um, the way they are encoded. And this was a preposterous idea. This was I mean, I took a, bot, a lot of body blows. I'm just gonna put it out there like that, um, of people saying that um, AI can't be, or algorithms can't be racist because 
AI and algorithms are just math and math can't be racist, right? I mean, so this like hyper reductionist way of thinking about technology and, and code, um, which is almost like, you know, asking the biologist, what does it mean to be human? And them saying humans are just cells in mitochondria. I mean, that's just a ludicrous, hyper-reductionist, essentialist way of thinking about it. That is, of course, true, but that's not the total story. What the story is, is how these systems become social and um, that they really don't live in the ether. They live on planet Earth with us um, and maybe to some degree in outer space now. Um, and they are part of the, the they are uh, social engagements and social artifacts. And so this is extremely important. And it has truly been the science and technology studies scholars um, um, who, who have also been, and this is important to answering the question, these have been women, feminists, people of color, black people um, who have been the people who have made these conversations legible by doing exactly what Deb said, which is studying the people who are most likely to be harmed, which are usually our own communities. Um, so the question then becomes, can AI become anti-racist? Well, you know, the same way that it can be um, deployed in ways that exacerbate racism um, and structural oppression means we have to think about the degree to which it's even plausible that a technology or an algorithm or uh, some lines of code can make an anti-racist society. I mean, the question is to what ends are these kinds of technologies put into existence? And I think one of the things that we have seen is that, you know, we have not deployed these technologies in service of things like redistributing wealth. That's a powerful way to address racism. We have not seen the, um, um, and, and sexism, by the way, we have not seen these technologies used to solve things like global economic inequality. But every year that we have more and more technology and data, we have more and more global inequality to go with it. The racial wealth gap is so profound in the United States that um, uh, social scientists say it will take more than 200 years to ever come close to closing if we stay on the current course. So the question is not, can the AI be anti-racist? It is, can the value system of the tech sector, of the companies that profit so handsomely from, I mean, but listen, we, we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't notice um, how the tech sector prints money um, off the backs of these problems and the people who are profoundly exploited and have so little voice. Um, so, you know, I think that is a really, we, we're talking about, um, you know, turning the Titanic, the Titanic around. Um, uh, and of course, the course we're on is not sustainable. When we think about um, inequality, racial, ethnic, gender, um, uh, global forms of inequality. So I think, you know, the challenge here has been that there's been a whole, let's say, you know, cottage industry of academics and um, industry people, and to some degree government who are starting to think about things like ethical AI. It's shocking to me because when I um, was writing about ethics in my book, when it was a dissertation 10 years ago, um, I was thinking about ethics in terms of ending oppression. And I was so, um, I should have known, right? Um, it was almost predict, this was almost predictable that ethics would actually be pulled out and used as an ethics washing kind of logic that um, does not at all deal with oppression, does not at all deal with the kinds of things that we've been talking about um, here. Um, I even think about, you know, Lily, I think about Tay, and, you know, there are a number of us who saw that coming. I was thinking about, um, you know, Miriam Sweeney at the University of Alabama, um, who's in the iSchool there, had written her dissertation 10 years ago about Miss Dewey. And, you know, we knew a lot about how Miss Dewey worked. And so we knew Kay was going to happen, was going to be, um, let's say, corrupted even more quickly. So, you know, there's, there's these things that I think we have to um, think about. Uh, um, and this is where, you know, if we're going to think about what it means to have, an, um, you know, oppression-free societies, 
then we actually have to center those conversations. And we have to understand what, what would it take to remake institutions and the law and our social practices and our customs that are, um, uh, when we're living in a time of, prof of profound rollback of civil rights, I mean, we're witnessing things like voter suppression, di disenfranchisement, um, the collapse of modern democracies around the world. Te the tech sector has played a huge role in that. And there's just, um, it's time for us to kind of, I think, stop focusing on the minutia of whether we can um, make, build better code, you know, make a more per perfect algorithm and think about the real consequences and what's at stake. Um, uh, to me, these are the things that keep me up at night. Um, and I worry that we will get so hyper-focused. I mean, we're living in an era of profound um, classification. I saw one of the questions, you know, that someone had raised is like, could we do away with these classifications and categories like race and gender? I mean, listen, people who are racialized and gendered in ways that are oppressive would let, love nothing more than to get to have the full experience of our humanity. Um, but as long as those categories exist in systems and are encoded in, in all the beautiful ways that my colleagues have um, story told the harm, um, you know, then I think um, it's, it's a novel and unfortunately a, a terrible use of resources to try to think about putting more um, money behind bad ideas about um, thinking there's gonna be an algorithmic fix to these problems. Hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off there because, you know, fortunately Sophia said what I would, um, uh, I was going to say and want to reiterate, and usually I'm on the spot for being the, the pessimist in the group, but I think um, what often comes around, uh, comes across as pessimism is really about uh, reality. And you know, I was thinking about doing, um, last week on Friday, I was doing a talk to uh, a group of students and others at the Stanford community. And uh, the title of the talk was supposed to be how to make your uh, technology anti-racist. And uh, given the week that we all had last week, I had determined by come talk time that, um, that that wasn't the talk to give. It was the talk to think about deeply about race, about racism, about oppression, and about technology's role in supporting it. And, and in my mind, we have not yet done enough uh, to immerse ourselves in that area of this problem to even move towards that question about how do we make technology anti-racist? Because Sophia is right, if we think about this just in terms of the technology or the technology fix, we're aimed, uh, we're poised to simply repeat the same old problems that have uh, continued this uh, for uh, decades, for decades and, and decades. And so, I think that if we're going to think about anti-racist technology, which I like the terminology, again, for much of the reasons that Sophia mentioned, because it goes to the heart of the matter, we cannot talk about ethics with what we really mean is race. So if we're talking about race, then let's talk about race and talk about oppression. And so I think those issues and those terms need to be at the center of this discussion. But as I began this conversation with, in terms of my definition of racism, the anti-racist technology has to be technological in, uh, uh, um, innovations or uh, uh, fixes at the level of infrastructure, at the level of systems, at the same level in which we find uh, our race and racial oppression mm -hmm. has been developed over uh, these many years. So we can't delude ourselves into thinking that uh, simply fixing a line of code or building a new application uh, that does a lim limited uh, and limited maybe good thing uh, in some way is going to be a fix when what we really need is a complete change and shift of uh, infrastructure. And, um, you know, and I will say I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic about the future in which that uh, happens, but I think that um, you know, certainly having these conversations make it more likely for us to get on that road than uh, what we have uh, tended to do for many, many years, which is simply to ignore the problem and specifically to ignore uh, the relationship between technology and 
uh, those broader issues of racism and, and oppression. Um, yeah, I wanted to just add, because I'm, <laughs> I, I may be a little bit more naive, so I'm more optimistic <laughs> as a result of that. Um, uh, uh, and, um, and I think that there is, there are opportunities in terms of a path forward. I think something that Charlton and Sophia are both mentioning, which is really important, is that um, I think when a disaster happens, when, um, you know, a techno technological deployment fails, um, or an AI product you know, ends up harming a particular population, people always say, oh, we didn't see this coming. You know, there's this um, uh, uh, sort of an, and a way to escape accountability. Companies will be like, you, you know, this risk is completely, you know, imperceivable. There's no way we could have figured this out. But as Sophia mentioned, you know, a lot of marginalized groups see this coming, um, you know, decades ahead of time. They attempt to articulate some of these issues and it's and it's usually you know marginalized voices even with the misinformation challenges we have today there's a long history um, of you know uh, a sort of these black female scholars that had brought up these issues of you know abuse on these platforms and their personal experience with that and their concerns as to how that could escalate to misinformation and um, you know for for years no one paid attention to what they had to say and Similarly, with that was me joining Timnit's experience where we had identified these issues. In my case, I had identified it at you know the company I was working at and tried to raise the issue so many times, but uh, you know just consistently um, ignored or consistently dismissed with respect to you know one. Um, I think uh, as Sophia mentioned, a lot of us um, uh, you know that see these issues see it partially because we're part of the communities that are impacted and it can be very difficult you know as someone that's part of you know the black community I um, am very emotionally affected by things that happen to you know people of color um, ways in which they're treated unfairly and I see the urgency of addressing this issue and uh, you know Ro Benjamin writes about this in her book Race After Technology where there's an urgency that you feel when it's your community that's being impacted by this situation, when you try to articulate that, um, uh, especially in the tech community where black voices are in the hyper minority, <laughs> um, uh, people don't respond with that same level of awareness and attention and urgency. And I've actually felt this even in you know, spaces that are meant to be talking about AI ethics, spaces that are meant to be having a conversation about fairness or bias. Um, I might articulate the urgency of addressing specific issues and people don't feel that same urgency. So, you know, that those concerns get dismissed. So I think, you know, one way to move towards anti-racist technology is simply, you know, listening to those from these marginalized communities um, uh, that are, you know, raising the alarm about all their concerns, paying attention to their concerns and giving it the weight it deserves and taking it seriously enough, um, I think is, you know, point zero <laughs> um, of what needs to happen. Um, and then the sort of other point I'm gonna, or two other points I wanna make very quickly. One other point is, um, you know, I think there's also a lot of value in equipping, you know, marginalized communities and communities of color to build their own technology or to reimagine or re redesign what technology can do for their communities. Um, you know, there's really great sort of, uh, you know, books about this, you know, uh, Data Feminism, uh, Design Justice is another great book. Um, and, you know, these are just, you know, uh, attempts, you know, uh, in, this, in this case, very, uh, you know, coming from more feminist literature, attempts to sort of say, you know, what would it mean for us to create Technology that prioritized, you know, the well-being of the data subjects involved. What it, what would it mean for us to design technology, um, uh, you know, that had a participatory element involved, that prioritized, you know, flattening power structures or challenging power structures? Um, there's a lot of interesting sort of like counter surveillance projects now of, you know, individuals that, um, you know, uh, uh, attempt to sort of rather than having a risk assessment. Um, on, you know, um, those, uh, you know, arrested and, and trying to determine how long they should be in jail, having a risk assessment as to like the validity of a, of a judge in terms of making, you know, fair decisions or having, uh, you know, this counter surveillance structure of surveilling police officers and their behavior and marking, you know, and, and, and flagging, you know, misbehaving police officers for further investigation and punishment. So this idea of, you know, giving technology or reimagining technology's use by you know these marginalized groups is, is something that's sort of picking up steam and something that 
I become a little bit hopeful about in terms of what would it mean to widen the participation uh, of those that are you know, impacted by this technology to sort of contribute more to the creation of these tools. And you know, how would that lead to uh, you know, AI tools being different, you know, embedding different values and manifesting differently in ways that are less harmful and uh, more beneficial to those impacted. Um, so that's something that I, I'm definitely a little bit more hopeful about. And then the sort of you know, final thing I'm gonna say is, you know, one of my biggest frustrations <laughs> uh, with this work is that uh, there is there really is not a lot of accountability in the AI space right now, um, uh, and there's not a lot of accountability, um, uh, as Charlton sort of hinted at, with respect to you know addressing issues of racism, <laughs> broadly speaking. Um, but in, in AI specifically, uh, you know, my experience on these engineering teams is that there's just so little um, in terms of, you know, tools um, uh, to help engineers, you know, think through the decisions that they're making uh, uh, at the time that I was working. And, um, you know, as recently as uh, I had done some audit work with um, colleagues at Google and it was a very similar issue of, you know, people not even documenting where the data come, came from, uh, not having any level of, you know, uh, processes around, you know, privacy and consent, just so many loopholes, so many <laughs> uh, things that were just, you know, basic due diligence, <laughs> uh, basic sort of steps in terms of evaluation on performance for different marginalized groups, um, you know, just so many things that I think the AI field, as this, you know, very nascent, product, uh, it's still trying to figure out, it's still trying to develop. My issue is that, um, you know, I don't think that these questions should be, um, you know, in progress while deploying products affecting, you know, millions of people, <laughs> of real people. Um, so, you know, I, I, I have a lot of um, uh, hope also in terms of how accountability for how people develop these systems you know, how much scrutiny they face when they deploy these systems and how that can be changed and how we can actually have, you know, regulatory structures, legal structures that can hold them to account when they, you know, seriously harm, um, you know, a, a, a certain group uh, in a systematic way. I think there should be, you know, consequences involved when, um, you know, some of these products are deployed and, and cause a lot of harm. Um, and right now there are none. So uh, there's, you know, almost little genuine incentive for these companies to really evolve in how they address these issues. Um, so yeah, that was like a very long winded Thanks, thing to say. I, I am no. quite optimistic about the future and I hope it, it gets uh, it gets better. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, well, we have, um, the, judging by the volume of questions from the audience that we definitely won't have time to address, I can see that there's, there's an interest um, for having uh, many more conversations like the one that we're having today. Um, uh, I guess I, I have one final question that kind of reflects a bunch of these, um, uh, a bunch of the audience questions. Uh, if, if somebody could answer it very briefly or address it very briefly in just like one minute or, or two, um, which is like, what could somebody who's watching, who cares about these issues, um, what could they do to do more? Um, if somebody has just a, uh, if some of you have a, just a very quick word of advice for um, somebody watching who cares about these issues, what they might do. Maybe that's an unfair question. <laughs> I, I mean, I would say one, Sophia mentioned earlier that there was a uh, a great deal of, of new work and uh, even work over the last 10 years, um, largely by people of color about this intersection of race and technology. Uh, I say a good first start is to avail yourself to that work, read it deeply, consider, engage it, engage with the scholars who wrote it. Um, and I think that would be a good basis for uh, thinking about how to proceed uh, in productive ways beyond that. I think that's yeah, great. I love that. I think, you know, I was just, I would just add to it that, um, you know, we really have to, um, you know, think about as Meredith Broussard says, you know, the techno chauvinism that exists in the industry and, you know, um, reimagine what, uh, you know, cross disciplinary teams should look like. Um, every single design and software team should have, or implementation team, even hardware should have, social scientists 
and humanist, people who understand society. I mean, I tell my students all the time, my computer science students, you have no business designing technology for society. You don't know anything about society. Um, you have not availed yourself to, to studying deeply. Um, so I think, you know, it's, um, it's actually, we have to go beyond um, reading and engaging. You have to bring in true experts. Um, you know, I know how to use my smartphone every which way. Should I, does that qualify me to be on a design team at Apple? Probably not. I mean, um, so, you know, just because people have like their functional lived experiences with race and racism and ethnicity, they know they got one black friend, you know, these kinds of things. That is completely insufficient. We should be hiring people with PhDs in black studies and ethnic studies and gender studies, um, sociology, people who know what they're doing, who can predict and see these um, problems coming and they should have as much power and clout and pay as um, the engineering teams that they work in. And history too. Let's let's not forget the history. For sure, the humanness. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, uh, we've come to the end of our time, and to to close um, this this wonderful discussion, um, I would like to ask each of you to participate in um, the museum's one word initiative, where we ask you to uh, present one word of advice for somebody starting out on in their career and to tell us um, briefly why you chose that word. And um, if you don't mind, Lily, I thought we could go alphabetically and I'll put you on the spot to begin. All right, so my word is create. And I think what people should remember is a lot of these technologies that we talk about today will be different in 20 years. And you know, if I would give you some advice on what to do, you know, believe that you will be part of making of making like that future that you imagine. So, great. Thank you. Charlton, could we ask you to go next? Yes, my word is expedite. Uh, and that comes from one of my very, very first jobs, which was not in tech or in academia, but at Burger King. And the expediter <laughs> was that person uh, who wasn't at a station either flipping burgers or running the cash register or the drive through It was the person who was responsible for simply getting an order from beginning to the end to that customer as quickly and efficiently as possible. So, um, so my advice and lesson learned was learn how to, uh, to make things happen. Um, learn how to do a lot of things in order to help people cut uh, from beginning to end in efficient but productive ways. Thank you. Safia? Okay. <clears throat> My word is rise. And I think about how important it is that we rise up and speak out about important issues every step of the way in every job. Be a person who has a voice and um, who is not um, passively sitting by while everyone else makes the decisions and makes the rules. Um, rise above when you know that, um, you know, uh, um, you're on the moral and kind of right side of history, um, you know, uh, rise above the conversation where, you know, the, the energy on that is low and it needs to be brought up to the next level. Um, do that and, you know, rise and shine. Um, think about how you can get up every day energized in making a difference and, um, you know, hold that optimism in your heart. That's great. And Deb, could you share yours? Um, so I'm in the process of moving, so I don't have a nice pretty paper. Um, so I'm not sure if you can read it, <laughs> but it says courage. I don't know if this is, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, but, um, and the reason I wrote it is, um, uh, I think it will take a lot of courage from the next generation um, to, to get us to, to get to these changes. Um, it is often really scary to be sort of um, confronting some of these companies about their practices and the impact that they're having on certain communities, but um, it will take a lot of courage for us to actually, you know, move into a, um, a sort of an anti-racist tech culture and machine learning culture and AI culture. So um, I hope that the next generation embraces that courage that, that's required. Well, thank you. And, and uh, thank you all so much. It's just been um, uh, just a great discussion with you all. I know I've learned a lot. I bet 
everybody else watching has too. So um, thank you from me and from everyone. And I'd like to pass things back to Daniel if I could. Well, thanks, David, and thanks to our panelists. Um, in quick summary, uh, it's a fascinating conversation, and I'm going to pick up on those words. I haven't done this before, but I think the cornerstone of a conversation like this, which is really so complicated, is to have the courage to rise up, to develop and create a common language, um, and then to expeditiously work on moving things forward. In the limited experience that I have, because it's, it's, it's certainly been the pace of technological change in the last few years that's driving these structural things to the surface, um, it's really the case that um, we have an immense responsibility. We have social norms associated with our nation states and our local communities, and yet we have technology that spans borders and business models that are driven by free access to technology in exchange for giving data away. So it's a complicated topic, but if we don't have a common language, we'll all struggle to try and move forward in a more effective way. So I can't thank you, David, enough and our panelists for sharing their views. Hopefully everyone here will walk away with a slightly better understanding that we do need a conversation. Um, the fundamental essence of privilege uh, comes from the things that you don't identify as part of yourself. And we've had this phenomenon in the last 10 years of AI technologies bubbling up in a way that have been, uh, I wouldn't say unexpected, but they're absolutely being applied to the norms by which we've created them. So thanks everyone for your time and attention. We'll look forward to having your support at CHM for programs like this. So please go to our webpage if you haven't. Uh, consider becoming a member. So thanks again, everyone, and, and good day.